Um, hello. Uh, we're going to continue today um, on our discussion on paper recycling. And the topic for today is going to be dispersion of contaminants in recovered paper stock. Um, so this actually is a section where, <coughs> or a part of the operation where, um, if uh, we haven't been able to remove contaminants um, b using screening or cleaning or washing or flotation, um, what, what we'll do is we'll say, okay, how else can we combat the quality problems that are going to occur if we leave these particles in our paper? Well, so the concept here, the strategy here, is that we're going to um, use some mechanical action and temperature, and that will, um, this mechanical action will break down these particles. And a number of good things can happen. Um, one of them is that they're so small that they don't bother us as a consumer of the recycled paper. And another one is, even better, that um, they're detached from the uh, they're detached from the um, fibers, and um, they're better able to be removed, um, maybe in a subsequent washing or um, flotation step. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at the definition of um, dispersion. So we're going to call it the use of mechanical action to decrease the particle size of contaminants and release the contaminants from the fiber surfaces. And below, um, <clears throat> what I'm showing is actually an exaggerated picture of what should happen during dispersion. Um, on the left here, what we see is um, this paper right here has these large specks of black, maybe it's, un uh, it's coated coating um, chips um, that have not been, that are very offensive to our eye. And then after we apply mechanical action, um, we can get paper where those um, large specks that are offensive are, have been broken down into smaller pieces. Now, um, this actually came out of a magazine, a vendor for a disperser unit, and I, I believe it's an exaggeration. And also, um, the other things I think about this one is that there was probably some kind of bleaching process and maybe perhaps even a washing or a cleaning process, um, washing or I should I'd be more exact, uh, flotation process perhaps to get rid of some of the ink that's been, some of the contaminants have been broken down. But this is the idea. This would be the perfect case scenario. <coughs> Okay, so what are the kind of things that we're trying to break down? Um, the contaminants that, um, that exist that can be offensive and large are things like inks, toners, coatings, chips of coating that have been unpulped, um, wax, blobs, let's call them, bitumen, um, varnish. Uh, varnish is like uh, UV cured coatings, let's say that's on the top of a magazine but still is attached to perhaps some printing on the surface of the magazine. Hot melts, which are um, adhesives used in boxes oftentimes, and then big um, chunks of glue and things like that. So all these kinds of contaminants, um, if we use mechanical action, we've got a chance to um, break them down. Um, we're going to apply the mechanical action, but we're also going to be assisted by heating in many cases. Um, and some of these contaminants that I list up above, um, they are uh, soften in the range of 60 to 120 degrees. And um, each adhesive, each contaminant has a specific softening point characteristic of itself. And, um, but this just gives you a range that if we do heat up to 100, we can start to soften some of these materials and actually make them more amenable to breakage um, during uh, mechanical action. Um, the other thing is that these contaminants typically can end up being large. And um, what we try to do, um, just to give you a kind of a gross ruler, um, is break them from above a 40 micron diameter size to below a 40 micron diameter size. And about 40 microns, depending on how good your eyesight is, is the um, cutoff between visible and subvisible size. So we're going to be trying to break these contaminants below 40 microns. OK. Um, there are two methods um, to do this dispersion. Um, and one of them is disk dispersion. We'll talk about that first. And the other one is what's called kneading. 
And um, they, the two um, processes work a little differently. Um, same concept, but they're, they're, the um, mechanical actions are applied in a different manner. We'll see, we'll contrast these two. So um, first, let's talk about disc dispersion, okay? Um, how does it work? Um, pulp at high consistency is passed between um, discs that have um, bars or teeth protruding from the surface. Um, so if you're familiar with paper refining, it's similar type of equipment to that, except for the fact that we have a different purpose and we're going to run it in a slightly different way um, in order to break contaminants rather than um, in typical refining before a paper machine, we, um, we're trying to um, increase the um, bond, bonding ability of the fibers by flexibilizing, swelling the fibers and fibrillating them. Here, we're just going to try and break down contaminants. Um, so one of the discs with teeth rotates, and um, that causes intense shearing action um, on the fibers and the contaminants um, that um, exist between the gaps of the two discs. Okay. Now, disc dispersion is um, typically run at high consistency, about 30% consistency. So oftentimes, we'll need some thickening equipment to get us to that consistency. Um, the temperature, um, it can range, but um, an average temperature might be 95 degrees Celsius, so we're close to the boiling point of water. We're going to need to use um, steam in order to um, heat the pulp up to that temperature. Uh, the retention time, interestingly enough, um, the pulp might only spend two seconds between these um, discs, and uh, that's a short time, and so we have to have a very intense action in that short time. Um, the rotational speed of the discs, around 1,500 RPM, which is relatively quick. The gap between the discs, um, 0 0.5 to 1.5 millimeters. So um, just to kind of get an idea, um, a hardwood fiber is about 1 millimeter. So if we had a hardwood fiber um, end to end, it, would, um, it could touch both of the teeth. Okay? And what we'll have actually between those teeth are um, flocks of high consistency pulp. So um, those will definitely be big enough to um, get pinched by the, to the teeth. The, the teeth. Um, one thing that we need to talk about is the um, energy requirements. And <coughs> for disc dispersion, we need about 1.6 to 4.0 horsepower days per ton. And this is um, one of the places where we have to spend some money to run disc dispersion. And um, if disc dispersion is not effective, it's not doing the job, it's not needed for your products, this is the reason, this energy requirement is the reason why um, you, you don't just run it just to run it, because it costs money to run. Among other things, there's other disadvantages to disc dispersion. We'll talk a little bit about them later. Okay, this is a um, disc disperser, um, and if you look at it, it's going to um, remind you of a refiner. If you've seen what a refiner looks like. Um, okay, let me get my pointer. So the feed pulp actually is going to come into the eye here. So here's our feed pulp, and that's at 30% consistency. And that pulp is going to follow this gap right here. Okay? And of course, these discs are circular discs. And in this case, we have um, a rotating shaft here. And that rotating shaft has teeth attached to it, and it might be hard to see, but the teeth are right here. Okay, so this, this disc is rotating at 1400 RPM, per, let's, let's say, and the teeth here are moving around, and they're coming very close to the teeth on another disc. Now the teeth on the other disc are, in this case, stationary. Okay, so we have stationary teeth here, so we're getting the teeth to teeth, um, closing the gap, the pulp is trying to squeeze through here, um, the teeth kind of cut and rub and break um, contaminants and actually fibers also, unfortunately. Um, and it's just a very quick action. Two seconds in here, bang, and then the um, pulp leaves out the exit. Okay, so there's no, so there's no rejects stream here. All the contaminants are broken up and still remain in the pulp. If we keep them there, they'll darken the pulp a little bit. Um, if we go to a um, de-inking step or a, some type of uh, cleaning or screen, cleaning process. Um, screening wouldn't work very well because we've broken this up into small particles, but 
Um, if we go to an operation that removes a contaminant, then we might not have that problem of darkening their pulp. Okay, so um, I mentioned to you that uh, dispersion actually, um, we run that on 30% consistency pulp. And so we've got to um, invest in some equipment to actually um, run this process. Um, here what we're doing is we're showing um, uh, the equipment that's needed to um, dewater the pulp to 30% consistency. Um, first what we'll do is we'll start off with a um, pulp around 3 to 5% and that's going to, um, that pulp may have already um, run through a low consistency thickener but then we'll take that from 3 to 5% pulp and we'll um, use a screw dewaterer so we've got a screw and it's just pressing that pulp and we've got a, um, um, a perforated um, cylindrical um, device here and we're going to get our pulp to about 8 to 12 percent consistency and then what we'll do is we'll have a screw press again very similar we've got a um, screw that's um, actually squeezing that pulp up against a plate around here and again a perforated cylinder that allows the water to go through and at that point this is called the dewatering zone right here at that point we're getting pulp consistency of about 28 to 30 percent okay then the pulp actually um, comes down here and it goes into this screw right here and this screw is actually um, used to um, break up clods of stock so we want to um, break up big big clumps of stock so this press is going to press it up against the plate we're going to get big big amounts big large um, kind of blocks of the pulp it'll come down here and it'll be broken up in this um, breaker screw and then when it's um, broken down and this is a picture right here of the pulp maybe again hard to see but um, the pulp's been kind of the clods have been broken up it will go down into a heating zone and this heating zone is going to um, have some agitation here and we will introduce steam into this um, pulp okay and the clever thing is that we're adding the steam to the high consistency pulp not the low consistency pulp because we want to conserve our energy and we don't want to be heating up water we want to be heating up the fibers and the contaminants which is our well we really want to just be heating up the contaminants but the fibers must be heated up also so we're in the heating zone here um, we're heating up to let's say um, 85 to 120 degrees Celsius with um, steam um, if we go above 120 degrees Celsius yes we will soften the um, contaminants more but we will also um, potentially damage the fibers so the um, integral strength of the individual fibers might be um, compromised because of chemical reactions that occur above 120 degrees Celsius okay so then um, what happens next is that um, the heated pulp from this heating zone right here will fall down into a feed screw <coughs> and that feed screw is going to push that in to right here our um, dis disc dispersion so we've got our disc dispersion here and then the um, outlet of the pulp comes this way and what we're looking at is a pretty big motor um, right here to run that disc dispersion and so our outlet pulp is going to be 30 <clears> percent <throat> and um, this is a typo uh, down here I don't even think you can see it but the outlet consistency is about 30 percent um, the pulp may be diluted and agitated for further processing so um, that's going to be a next step all right um, what I want to do is kind of just show you some equipment here um, this is a screw press um, from a, um, actually it's an o, um, ONP mill, I believe. Um, ONP or o OCC, I believe it's OCC actually. Um, and what happens here is uh, we've got a feed chute and the pulp comes down here and the screw is in here and there's a, um, and then uh, looking in this um, in insert here, um, this right here, we open up one of these things and we can actually see the perforated um, it's hard to see the perforated thing, perforated um, cylinder, but um, you can look and see the water dripping out of the um, screw press. So, prior to this, the um, the pulp was probably um, 
thickened using a disc filter or some kind of um, gravity decker. Now after that screw press, um, what happens is that pulp falls down into the um, heating zone. And this is the heating zone right here. And remember it had like a, um, it had a, uh, a, um, a rod in the middle with, bath with um, paddles that kind of um, agitated the pulp. And then these lines right here, as you can tell, um, are st is steam. And so the steam is added here. And it's this, in this case, it's 35 pounds steam. And so the 35 pound steam is added across this heating zone. And good agitation will heat up the pulp and uh, soften the contaminants. OK. So after that, um, here's that heating zone. Then after the heating zone, <coughs> the pulp falls down into this screw conveyor. And the screw conveyor actually forces it into the disperser. And the disperser is kind of hard to see here. But this thing right here is the disperser. <coughs> um, in this inset right here, um, uh, we can see the um, r refiner right here. Okay, So here's the refiner. And what we have here is um, a little um, a motor, but we've got a, sp a special kind of motor. It's a, an ABM motor, an ABM motor, an awfully big motor. So um, we've got to spend a lot of money, actually, to turn this, um, turn this rod and actually run the disperser. OK, so that's disk dispersion. Um, Uh, to kind of just review disk dispersion, um, we use intense mechanical action. We have to heat the pulp up. The pulp's at high consistency, and it passes through these um, closed gap teeth. Um, unfortunate thing about disk dispersion is that it does cut a lot of fibers. And so that cutting action can be a problem if strength is an issue or runnability on your paper machine. So there's an alternative, a little bit more gentler alternative. Um, let's go to the next slide, and that's called kneading. Um, I like to think about um, dispersion and kneading like this. Um, dispersion is like if you went to go get a massage and um, the uh, masseuse would be banging your um, back with their fist, just smashing you. And it takes five seconds, but they punch you out, basically. Now, kneading is, is the kind of massage that you would like. It's going to be a slower, gentler, um, easier to kind of relax and enjoy <laughs> kind of massage. So um, let's just kind of see how kneading works. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to take pulp at high consistency and, and mix this pulp and shear it between moving bars on a slow rotating shaft and stationary bars attached to the housing. Okay, And um, the strong shear forces that we create from these um, moving bars um, is going to cause a lot of mainly, now in this case, fiber to fiber rubbing, which breaks the contaminants. And I should mention that with the disc dispersion, most of the action occurs because the teeth actually hit the contaminants or the teeth actually hit the fibers. In kneading, that's not the case. It's more fiber fiber rubbing. OK, so the typical conditions, um, we're looking at consistencies, again, around 30% K. Um, temperatures, um, in many cases, uh, we don't use as, as high a temperature, so 40 to 50 degrees Celsius is typical for kneading. Um, now, the retention time, 10 to 60 seconds. So if we think back to disk dispersion, it was um, more like two seconds. RPM um, ra ra ranges around 500, 600 RPM. Um, a little bit sl slower, maybe half the speed as um, the disk dispersion. Um, the gap between the bars, 10 to 40 millimeters. Um, recall disc dispersion was 1 millimeter. Remember I mentioned that a hardwood fiber could actually um, cross the gap. Um, 10 to 40 millimeters, well, we would need 10 to 40 hardwood fibers to cross that gap. So you see that the, um, the actual moving bars here are not going to impact as many fibers the, um, percentage of fibers that the uh, disc dispersion was going to. And then the last thing on the bottom is um, <coughs> the uh, energy consumption. And 
the energy consumption is uh, 3.0 to 4.5 horsepower days per ton. So that is very con that very um, important factor. So it's um, quite energy consumptive. Okay, so let's go ahead and we'll look at a diagram of a single shaft meter. Okay, so previous to the um, pulp coming into our system here, um, we've uh, we've already thickened our stock to thirty percent. So again. Um, it might be a gravity decker and some type of screw press, perhaps. Um, the stock enters the uh, feed screw portion um, down here. And um, the pulp will come in here. And then the screw is actually going to push that pulp in towards the kneading section. OK? Now, um, in this feed screw, I, might, I should mention that um, oftentimes steam might be added or even a bleaching chemical like peroxide is added. And um, the reason why is because we've got one or two, we've got some pretty good retention time here at high consistency. And um, that bleaching chemical will, um, is, you don't want to do bleaching at low consistency because you're diluting your active chemical bleaching agent. And so um, this is a nice place where you have good mixing, some retention time, high consistency stock. And, um, it's a nice place to do maybe some bleaching. Okay, so the um, stock is actually kneaded in this region right here. Um, and what um, this is showing is we've got our shaft, and these things are teeth. So these are teeth, and they might be uh, six inches long. And we can see some other teeth here. So here's a teeth on the sh tooth on the shaft. And then we also have some teeth that are attached to the housing. So these teeth right here, this one, and this one, and this one, and this one, these are stationary, remain on the housing. And so what happens is the pulp comes in, and then the pulp is between these mo the moving and the stationary teeth, and the pulp, it just gets kneaded. It's a good way of putting it. And the fiber-fiber rubbing that occurs actually is breaking the um, contaminants. And that's an important point. It's the fiber-fiber rubbing not the metal to contaminant. In, in kneading, fiber fiber rubbing does the breaking. In disc dispersion, metal teeth um, contacting contaminants does the breaking. So here we're getting fiber fiber rubbing. That's why when I use my analogy of the massage, what we're getting is a much slower, softer, gentler mechanical action as opposed to the disc disperser. All right, that was a single shaft kneader, and we also can have double shaft kneaders. And um, it's the same as a single shaft kneader, except we've got two shafts now, and the shafts are rotating, and, and oftentimes they're, ro they're always rotating in um, different directions. So here, up here in, on this diagram, we've got one shaft that's rotating in a clockwise fashion, and then this shaft is rotating at a counterclockwise fashion, okay? And the other, um, so that's going to cause in this area some um, significant shear action. And then the other thing that's done is that um, one of the shafts is usually mo um, rotating at a different uh, rotational speed than the other shaft. So this one might be moving 20% faster or slower than this shaft. And that'll also um, improve the movement of the pulp and the um, shear action. Um, so we get some intense shearing action. Now, this is a picture of the kneader um, with the lid off. So the lid has been taken off. This might be a case for um, when we have some maintenance issues and we have to take the lid off. So the lid is taken off, um, and you can see the two shafts, and you can see the teeth. Okay, and these teeth are large. They're six, eight inches sometimes. Okay, now this cartoon is nice also because it kind of shows a lot of the different parts. Um, this is the feed right here, and the pulp falls down in, and you can see the two screws. They're attached to the shafts. They will push that pulp into the kneading zone. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, here are our kneading um, shafts with our teeth and the, the teeth are moving in a counter, ca in a counter motion 
type of direction, one clockwise, one counterclockwise. And then the pulp is going to fall out somewhere here, which we don't see. Um, here's the kneader with the uh, lid on down here. So the pulp falls down through here. It gets kneaded through here um, with the lid on, and then it, the accepts kind of fall out the bottom down here. Okay, so some drawbacks to kneading. It's pretty energy intensive, 3 to 4.5 horsepower days per ton. You don't run this unless um, there's a need. Uh, I'm very familiar with kneading of, kneading of mixed office waste or um, printing and writing grades that are going to be recycled um, and used for uh, um, use in copy paper. So the, um, one of the mills that I'm familiar with um, uses kneading actually to break down toner and coating particles and large ink particles, let's say, um, breaks all those down and then actually dilutes the pulp and goes into another flotation cell and also does bleaching in there. Um, and then that pulp is um, used as a, um, it's mixed in with um, virgin fiber to make copy paper. Um, there is a very high initial capital cost to put in a kneading system. So if you have a recycling system and you want to think about putting in kneading or dis disc dispersion, both of them have high initial capital costs. And part of the reason is because you've got to invest in the thickening equipment that um, has to occur before the um, dispersion. Um, so yeah, that, that's why this next bullet requires thickening equipment. That's, that's a, a capital pro issue, and then it's also a maintenance and maintenance issue. Um, kneading doesn't typically reduce sticky size, and this may be an advantage because um, sometimes it's better to have the stickies large than small. Um, if we have the stickies larger, it's easier to screen them, and screening actually is one of the more effective ways to remove stickies. So it does not reduce stickies. And then the rotors can wear out. So every one or two years, you have to replace your rotors, your teeth, because of all that shear action and the abrasive material that's in the fi pulp, um, every one or two years you have to replace your rotors, and that's, that can be expensive. Um, disc dispersers, um, you also have to re replace those discs, but the discs aren't as expensive. But they may wear out um, a little bit faster because of the faster speeds and the closer clearances of the teeth. Okay, so now I just kind of want to summarize and contrast kneading versus dispersion. Okay, these are both methods to decrease contaminant size. Um, okay, so for dispersion, what we're going to say is we're going to use some shearing action. And really, um, the other thing that I should have put there is there's a lot of metal to contaminant contact. For kneading, we're going to get a rubbing. So it's um, rubbing, and it's really fiber to fiber rubbing. It's not the metal to contaminant rubbing. So um, what happens for kneading is that there's a contaminant. It's in between fibers. The fibers rub the contaminant and break it. Um, both have high consistencies. Tem um, the temperature of kneading is usually lower than the temperature for dispersion. Um, as I said before, kneading is a slower, more gentler massage. Um, it's going to have a lower RPM and it's going to have a higher retention time. So adding um, bleaching chemical in the kneader is a very common practice. And then of course the gap. The gap between teeth and the disc dispersion are about one millimeter and the gap between um, teeth, let's say, um, or bars is about 10 to 40 millimeters in kneading. So what that tells you is that um, in kneading, we're going to depend on the fibers to actually, fiber fiber rubbing to do the mechanical action, actually impact the contaminants. And th that's not the case in dispersion. In dispersion with that small gap, it's pretty likely that the metal, metal teeth will impact the contaminant. Okay, so um, again, <coughs> some more comparison, some of the effectiveness um, pluses and minuses of kneading and dispersion. Um, one study shows uh, that disc dispersion is going to break down um, tappy dirt 75%. So tappy dirt is um, visible dirt. 
So um, tappy dirt measures visible dirt, um, and so the dispersion can actually reduce that visible dirt by 75%. It might um, lower our brightness of our pulp, but we understand that. Um, and kneading, 85%, so a little bit more effective. Toner reduction, yes, dispersion will work. Um, kneading is actually better, so we get a better um, efficiency in toner breakdown with the kneader. Um, stickies reduction, the disperser actually does a better job here because um, of the intense metal to contaminant um, contact action. So stickies reduction is better for dispersion. Kneading, um, some, many studies have shown no effect, but <coughs> that's kind of controversial. Um, and like we said, uh, stickies reduction, when I say better for dispersion, what I mean is that there's more reduction that's occurring. It may not necessarily be better. Um, if your mill doesn't have a stickies problem and you just want to remove the, um, the um, offensive look of the stickies, then you'd want disc dispersion. But um, if you want to keep your stickies large and screen them out, um, you'd want to use kneading. Fiber cutting. Um, I didn't stress this, but I should uh, mention it now and <coughs> make a good clear point about this. <coughs> In disc dispersion, that gap's one millimeter. So let's say if you have a softwood fiber that's three millimeters long. Um, there are pretty good chances that that um, fiber is going to um, see the um, metal teeth and it may even um, get cut. And fiber cutting is substantial for dispersion. So that is a drawback. So if strength and drainage on your paper machine is an issue, um, dispersion can be, um, accentuate that problem. Kneading, on the other hand, um, it says none, no fiber cutting, but um, that's probably not 100% true. There's probably some fiber breaking, let's call it, but um, it's insignificant compared to dispersion. So for kneading, um, there's very little fiber cutting. Um, and I guess this is a good point. Dispersion is very common um, in use uh, with, let's say, OCC, old corrugated container grades, and ONP, old newsprint grades. And if you think about them, those are fibers that have the lignin in them. They're, they're pretty, um, the fiber itself is strong. Um, so uh, that's an issue. That, um, the dispersion can, we can get away with dispersion with ONP and OSCC because of the inherent strength of those individual fibers that have lignin in them. Now, in contrast, kneading is often used in mixed office waste. If you think about mixed office waste, um, that mixed office waste typically has um, a lot of chemically bleached hardwood fibers. And those chemically bleached hardwood fibers um, are very susceptible to damage. And um, if we're, um, <coughs> so if we're tr going to try to break down the contaminants in there, we want to make sure that we don't hurt our fibers. So um, chemically bleached pulps, like mixed office waste, often contains quite a bit of. Um, we want to use kneading because it's more gentle and we will not break as many of the fibers. Um, Fines generation just kind of follows um, that uh, fiber cutting. So we're going to generate some fines um, in disc dispersion, but in kneading, we're not going to um, generate as many fines because of the more gentler action of the fiber fiber rubbing rather than the metal, metal to contaminant or metal to fiber um, action. Um, so just as a um, review, let's just kind of do an exercise. I've got a cartoon that kind of portrays the two processes, disc dispersion and kneading. Um, so here we have over here, um, we're showing two solid objects. I won't say if they're teeth or, or bars, but um, the big hint here is that we've got a gap. It's about one millimeter. So that suggests that we um, have, this is going to be our disc dispersion. Um, on this cartoon right here, we've got our bars, let's call them, and the bars are separated by a gap of 10 to 40 millimeters. Okay, so I'm actually going to go way out on a limb and say that this is going to be our kneading operation. Okay, so first let's run the, um, this operation here on the left, and I'll hit the play animation button. And what happens 
um, you notice that the, um, the teeth actually um, come into contact with the um, contaminant particle. If you think about it, um, it's not very unusual to have a contaminant particle, um, something like a chip of coating material or adhesive or um, uh, maybe a co um, varnish or a hot melt. They, they can be um, very reasonable to think that they're going to be around a half a millimeter to one millimeter, 1.5 millimeter, or, or much larger. So we can see that this animation is kind of accurate in the fact that we, we're seeing a contaminant that's actually um, about one millimeter and um, the motion of the teeth are, are directly impacting that contaminant and breaking it. So very reasonable right there. Okay, now let's run the um, kneading. And what we know uh, already, we've got a 10 to 40 millimeter gap. Let's think about it. Um, wax particles, coated chips um, that have gotten all the way through the recycling process. They've gone through probably some pressure screens. They're going to be um, much less than 40 millimeters or 4 centimeters or about 2 inches, right? This is about a 2 inch gap. So um, we would expect that um, there's not going to be a contaminant big enough to kind of cross this gap here. So let's just see what happens with this one. So we notice a couple things that are occurring here. First of all, this bar at the top is moving a lot slower than when this tooth right here was moving. So we notice that our motion is about half the speed of the disc dispersion. And then the other thing we notice is our contaminant um, is actually in the middle of both of those bars and it never really touches those metal bars at all, does it? But what I'm also showing here is that there's that flock of um, yellow, in this case I put yellow, um, yellow fibers. And it's actually that flock of yellow fibers that's a, um, actually applying the um, mechanical action to the contaminants. So we see here that kneading is a much slower, gentler, fiber-to-fiber -fiber rubbing of the fibers. And you can see that um, the fibers, and I might not have the size scale all perfect and everything, but there are going to be very few fibers that are going to be cut or pinched, let's call it pinched, between the bars. There's usually going to be a, several layers of fibers, and each layer will rub against the next layer, and there will be several layers between um, between the um, two bars. So again, one last time. Disc dispersion pretty quick. Kneading pretty slow and using that fiber to impart the um, mechanical action. So um, just kind of to review, what we've talked about are two different methods that we can use to, um, to break down contaminants to um, subvisible sides. Now the other thing that we can do with these um, methods of applying mechanical action is to um, actually in many cases we um, detach them from the fiber and make them smaller so that both of these things, detachment of the fiber and the small size, will allow f um, washing or flotation to be more effective. So um, if we have the ability to have a de-inking process after um, dispersing or after uh, kneading, then we can take advantage of maybe we've separated some of the inks from the fibers and maybe we've made them smaller so that they're more amenable to washing or flotation. Um, the drawbacks of kneading and dispersion. Um, they both are energy intensive, so it costs money to run the motors um, to, uh, to run the um, disperser or kneader. So they're, they're cost um, they're costly. The other thing is that they, um, there's capital equipment that needs to be purchased for them, thickening and the um, actual um, kneading or dispersion. And um, maintenance can be an issue. Um, you've got to maintain all the, the washer, the thickener, the, the heating zone, all this stuff. And so maintenance is another issue. And then finally, um, we can talk about um, fiber cutting. Uh, with disc dispersion, this can be an issue. We can degrade the fiber quality, and um, if we overdo it, we'll, um, we'll have um, very weak pulp that will not drain very well on the paper machine. Kneading is um, not 
as um, hard on the fibers because of the slower rubbing action. And that's why kneading is used in mixed office waste and other chemically pulped and bleached fibers that are um, very susceptible to fiber damage. And this, that will conclude um, my um, presentation on kneading and dispersion.